So Robert, I might have to pass these items on to you. So the next items on the agenda are um, there's, there are terms that I'm not familiar with. So so when I was working for the Department of the Navy as a contractor, the big thing was littoral warfare, which nobody seems to be talking about anymore. It's not that many years ago. Uh, but your next items, you've got the high-low mix of platforms, and you've got electromagnetic maneuver warfare, which we might have covered already. I'm not sure if they're more exotic terms than, than what we've already been talking about. But um, do you want to proceed with those items? Sure. I, uh, Bruce, I think actually um, Jerry, Paul, and Scott have uh, covered all of those. I, you know, injected a little bit on uh, high-low mix. Um, you know, we've, we've teased that out a little bit, uh, and the conclusion of the group seems to be that we're moving to uh, more distributed, maybe smaller, uh, maybe faster, less of the big, iconic capital uh, ship. Um, the electromagnetic maneuver warfare, as you even mentioned, you know, uh, cyber and in this kind of information spectrum, um, I, I think we've, we've teased that out pretty well. And littoral goes directly to uh, the Marine Corps Force 2030. You know, this idea of, all right, we'll have these advanced expeditionary bases and, and um, you know, the Navy's going to support us and we're going to support the Navy with fires from ashore to uh, potentially take out um, targets at sea uh, to, uh, you know, kind of leverage marine expeditionary capability in a naval fashion. Um, you know, the littoral warfare ship, it got a bum rap. We spent a lot of money. Hey, it didn't quite work out, but we're, you know, kind of finding our way to what smaller, um, kind of close in those ships that might operate inside of the weapons engagement zone of the enemy. Uh, so I think we've teased those out. One thing that has, uh, that Bruce, you've prompted by leading off with, hey, I, I did an examination of Force 2030 with the Marine Corps. And then we set up this discussion on, hey, what does the future of the Navy look like 2030 and beyond? And you, you know, you really got from this panel kind of a, a wide aperture look at possibilities. And it, I think it goes to the cultural, and, and you're used to this, Bruce, you know, from your own experience, this cultural difference between the Marine Corps and the Navy in the United States, and it's true uh, in Great Britain. If, you know, when I was the 7th Fleet Commander and the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force Commander, John Whistler, my counterpart in Okinawa, if he said X, then 20,000 Marines lined up and they said X. And Scott remembers this, if the U.S. 7th Fleet Commander said X, then 20,000 sailors of the U.S. 7th Fleet said, well, you know, I think Thomas, what he meant to say was this, or, you know, I think that's advisory in nature, and, and we may or may not. And this cultural difference is, it goes back to Paul's point of, I think we're going to see, because, uh, you know, the Marine Corps is there firstest with the mostest as far as, hey, here's our PowerPoint presentation, and we're going to lead the argument, and they're going to end up dragging Navy along with them. And part of it is this cultural difference. I'll leave it at that. Robert, that was great. I, I was laughing uh, for a couple of reasons. John Whistler was uh, my roommate for a period at the Naval Academy, and uh, I can understand why people would do what he says, but it's true all the way up to the commandant. The commandant says, this is what we're going to do. The Marines go, Roger, d done. And maybe that comes from the idea that, you know, this Carl Builder's old uh, a book that said, you know, if, if the, if the problem with armies and ground forces is control because everybody's going every which way. Navy doesn't have that problem historically. You're on a ship, CEO says go left, the ship goes left. Not only do, does, do the people 
not disagree with them. They don't have the ability to disagree with them. And so that's where our culture comes from. Uh, so when, when sailors have the ability to disagree, they, they're darn sure going to do it, as you well know. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's a, a huge point. And I, I totally agree that, that uh, if, at least right now, I, I have been concerned that Navy is not reluctant to change. It's organizationally incapable of changing fast enough now, absent <clears throat> something like a Pearl Harbor. And that's, you know, I get, I, when I get my, what did you call yourself, Paul? A skeptic? Yeah, skeptic or cynic, cynical or pessimistic. That's kind of where I go, okay, I can't solve all these problems, so we just have to rely on a Pearl Harbor to help us do it. Um, I certainly hope that isn't the case. I would, I would like to add one comment on the high-low mix, um, and it's this. We, we tend to, when we think of force structure assessment, I think this is what we're still doing. We're thinking, okay, how are we gonna how are we gonna prevail inside the let's say the first island chain so we can affect events in the war? Great. Um, the Marines are like, how can we sit up on some island somewhere and be able to do this stuff without really specifying out in the open press what which islands we're gonna sit on and who which countries are gonna allow us to put forces on their territory? Uh, what if you look at World War II as an example? And, and World War II, Robert, you mentioned the idea that the Chinese are are reinventing or reapplying the concept of massive warfare, which we've walked away from. Uh, World War II, at, in, in May of 1945, and I think I have this right, in the, in the UK, the Royal Navy in, was employing 800 minesweepers to keep the ports clear in May of 1945. Um, in the Guadalcanal campaign, what, you know, we, we know about all the big battles that Horn Fisher writes about and so on and so forth, but what's, what's lost a lot of times is the role of the old four stack destroyers. We needed them to do, you know, uh, amphibious transports, uh, seaplane tender duties, uh, all sorts of ancillary roles, mine, mine layers and things like that, that, you know, if you look at, at the ability of the United States Navy today to support those kind of uh, secondary tertiary mis missions, it's non-existent. I mean, how many fleet tugs do we have? I think we have two. Uh, and we're going to decom those because we're going to eventually build two more. Um, so, so that kind of thinking and, and how much how much it took us to get the logistics down, which didn't really, and we weren't rearming at sea until forty three or forty four. Only we were only refueling at sea and barely that in forty two and forty three. So my point is, uh, when when we think about distributed forces and smaller platforms to so they can survive in the threat environment. We also have to think about all the other ancillary stuff that's going to go into the United States Navy projecting power several thousand miles away from home and being able to stay there. And that discussion isn't happening a lot. So Jerry uh, and I love history and we, we try to draw from it. What, what is fundamentally important here is that some of these things are coming back around again. There's just no question about it. Whether we're gonna be over there, that kind of thing is coming around again. The Marine Corps EABO concept is nothing more than the post mahanian uh, supporting fires from airfields concept of World War II. And you can see how that worked, where you then the supporting fires was an airfield. And the airfield was so important and whole campaigns were fought over and around it because of the airfields. Guadalcanal is a perfect example. Um, so not everything's gonna be the same. Cyber is gonna be a lot different. EW is probably around the same. Strike is gonna be the same. Surveillance is gonna be different and so on. There's so some, some different, some not. But you can look back and say, oh yeah, I can see how we're gonna have to do that again. But we're not finished doing that. Or what lessons did we learn from doing that in the first place so that we can get ready for the next time? Uh, as I said, some things change and some things don't, but we can, we can parse out those, the difference and then exploit the, the lessons from the past. Well, thank you, gentlemen. We're, um, we're running out of time, so we're gonna be kicked off, this, off, off the server in less than 19 minutes anyway. 
I think there's one question that if you've got time for it, I think we should address, and that is whether the United States Navy ca could rely more on certain allies in certain regions or possibly for certain capabilities. So take the British, the British Royal Navy has traditionally provided minesweeper expertise to NATO as a whole. Uh, Australia has has definitely, has rhetorically at least, it's still got to put its money where its mouth is. Rhetorically at least, it is, it is committed to confronting China uh, and investing in, it, in military capabilities to do so. So can the United States Navy benefit from its, uh, from its allies? Can it, can it ask its allies to perform certain things to relieve the pressure on the United States Navy's needs to reposture and restructure in certain regions with certain capabilities? Bruce, I'm going to lead it off and then I'm going to ask uh, comments of, of all three because I think that is uh, absolutely a critical question. It fits very well into this next 10 year window that you wanted to look at up to 2030 and beyond. Um, Scott Tate, especially because he helped me craft it, um, knows that I routinely talk on. Um, our treaty alliances and fighting with our treaty allies, fighting alongside them. Uh, one of the uh, allies that we are closest to, especially from a Navy perspective, is of course Japan. We operate daily with the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force. Uh, we operate almost daily with the Republic of Korea Navy. These are very capable navies. Uh, yeah, some differences in capabilities, some differences in capacities. The thing that jumps out most is, and I'll be interested in the, in, in the rest of the group, um, is the, I'll, I'll call it almost a cultural difference in rules of engagement and how we're seeing um, navies, whereas the US Navy, I think at its core believes or knows it has to go be offensive, despite having been kind of locked into the defensive for years now uh, from an acquisition perspective. Um, so there's that disconnect. And we still, despite the fact that we operate with these navies routinely, we still are making what I would consider basic blocking and tackling mistakes. All right. The difference when you map it over to um, the Royal Navy or the Royal Australian Navy, uh, these allies that are within the Five Eyes construct, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, the UK, and the United States, A, you have um, the advantage of the same language. You also have the advantage of a shared intelligence picture. Where you come up short is those navies absolutely lack capacity. But from a command control and niche capabilities, those navies absolutely can fight with us today. Not only alongside, but they are force multipliers. You know, I think most of the students would even know that um, Royal Navy officers and, and, hey, as the Seventh Fleet Commander, I had an Australian officer in my N3, in my operations shop, okay? So interchangeable in that regard. You just get into this, um, you know, this, this idea of capacity and, and where things fit together. Scott, is that a fair... Uh, encapsulation of the issue? I think so. Y yes, sir. Um, to me, in terms of low intensity conflicts, absolutely. Lots of partners and allies out there that we ought to work with to get ready to deal with low and low, low grade stuff, terrorism, insurgency, crime, stuff like that. So um, for low intensity conflict and special operations, I would say an absolute yes. When you get to pure competition level stuff, there's really only two. Uh, and it comes down to Japan and NATO. Uh, NATO, because if we're fighting Russia, NATO has no choice but to fight. And Japan, because if we're fighting China, Japan has 
no choice but to fight because they can't afford to see the U.S. forced out of the region. Um, the rest of everybody that is an ally, partner, or friend, if we're fighting Russia or China, I think is going to wait it out until it's clear who the winner is going to be. In which case, by the time they would come in on our side, it would be too late for them to be terribly useful. Paul or Jerry on that? Well, you really uh, touched my cynical core. Um, Wait, I was waiting for Paul to answer because I knew that it was overflowing. Really? My cup runneth over, I guess, in, in cynicism here. Uh, Barney Kelly was the N3, uh, Op 06, B and then acting. I and uh, he, he, he called me in one day and he said, because I was just back from the senior staff college in Tokyo, you know, direct onto the Navy staff in, in the Pentagon. And I, uh, he said, are the Japanese going to be with us? And he said, I don't think I or anyone else can answer that question. And I don't think that's changed. I think it's just gotten worse. Um, and uh, that the, the Jap you're right, of course, that you'd think that they don't have any choice but uh they're still bobbing and weaving over the decision um let me give you an example that may at least uh, illustrate if not make the case uh, I, I don't remember the carrier which was the carrier in yokosuka at the time of 9 11 that was um I think it was still in the independence no kitty hawk kitty hawk was there for the nine i think it was kitty hawk Wh whichever ship it was it became very important to get that ship underway get it out of port they didn't want it in port being a sitting duck they had no idea what was going to happen next and because of the i'm pretty sure i have my facts right and forgive me if i screwed this up and the Japanese admiral, who was the commander of the fleet escort force, the, the Japan's uh, surface force, sortied the JMSDF's fleet escort force and to escort the ship out of port. And he was sacked. He was sacked. He was the number one hot runner in the JMSDF from the time he was a midshipman. He's a, he's a good friend of mine. He doesn't talk about this much. And so when the chips are down, you know, what happens? Uh, the Japanese obviously have a very conflicted relationship with China. But in truth, and I'm speaking more generally now than just the Japanese, but specifically about the Japanese, they have a very conflicted relationship with us. Very, very conflicted. And so as a result, when you, when you work with them, it's great to work with them. They're terrific, very professional. Um, but look at the world. It looks like they're looking at the world from the same perspective, but boy, that is just not right. And so remembering that we've got what we wanted, which was civilian control of the military in Japan, no matter what you think about the JMSDF itself, what should be referred to as the Japanese Navy. Um, the civilians are absolutely of a different cut of cloth. I think that's true more broadly. I think it's true in NATO for sure. Uh, I've worked a little in NATO as a contractor, so I don't have much of a perspective, but I didn't like what I saw. The whole decision-making apparatus was really just, it was really quite something to, to watch. So I would say, that there's something to England and Australia, but now they, on the other hand, are hampered by capacity. I mean, it's just not there. The capacity is not there and it's not gonna be there. It's not gonna be there. So this is a real conundrum for the United States. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe, if it's not clear by now, I believe in this over there to stay. I believe in defending in the first island chain 
from the first island chain with the people who live there. I believe that the alliances are ends to a mean, but uh, means, excuse me, means to an end, but very important in that regard. On the other hand, this China US thing, it's between us and them, us and the Chinese. And all these other allies, friends, and onlookers, they all know that. And so this makes that question completely imponderable, but at the same time, very, very important. Um, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dovetail on that in my own inimicable way. Uh, first of all, you know, the, the fact that it's going to be us and China is highly likely, although I think the Russians might have something to say about that. But at the end of the day, you know, what, what started in September of 1939 as Germany against Poland quickly became Germany against Western Europe and eventually became a global world war, or as uh, some authors would say, several war world wars. So <clears throat> whether or not it starts as a U.S.-China co conflict, it's it given, given the stakes involved and in essentially deciding on the ultimate nature of the international system, you, 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 the, 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 there won't be any fence sitters. Everybody's going to have to jump in. Very few will be able to remain neutral. That's just the way history works. Whether it happens again, I don't know. With respect to allies and how we work, I agree with Scott completely that um, that that there's so much that we can do with them in the, in the in the gray zone, the pre-war stuff. Um, my my thought would be, <clears throat> if anything, what you would perhaps be able to use uh, allied forces for is defending our the, the lines of communications, which will not only go to our forces but will go to uh, to our allies as well. Um, but but none of that can happen <clears throat> if two things are missing. Number one is the kind of a technical level is is interoperability. And Robert will know much more about this than I, and Scott will know more about it than I do. But my sense in talking to people uh, is that we really haven't solved the interoperability problem, where, where the US military is going in one direction very quickly, and we are having challenges keeping our allies up, up to speed. This is particularly true with command and control, uh, communication, security, cyber network stuff. All that, all those things, we 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 would have to really buckle down to get the interoperability, not just fixed but sustained. And then finally, I think the most important challenge with with the Allies is we you know we can go through all the you know the Navy to Navy talks and the exercises here, hither and yon, but if the United States doesn't have a demonstrable will. To support its own interests in these regions, then the allies are going to do what Scott said, which is they're going to vote with their feet because it's stupid for them not to. And so, so you know whether we have you know the Gabriel Giffords in in the South China Sea doing things against Chinese uh, overreach, let's say, uh, and at the same time you have two carrier strike groups if, if operating in the South China Sea. Uh, that's great, but what is the what is the long term message? Where you know how does how is that conveyed to not just the Chinese but the regional partners and regional allies? And I think right now uh, they might be a little skeptical about our commitment over the long term. Well, thank you all. I'm going to invite you to uh, make any last minute comments. Uh, anything you think has not been said that should have been said. Anything we didn't address that you think we should have addressed? I'll just give you a second for that. Okay. So uh, I'm going to formally thank you all. I'm going to thank you first for your military service, your service to the Navy. I'm going to thank you for your public service in speaking here tonight on the future of the United States Navy from 2020 to 2030 and beyond, speaking to my students and the public at large. I have been informed and stimulated by this discussion. And uh, I am very grateful that you uh, came together for it. And I'm grateful to Vice Admiral Robert Thomas for organizing the panel. Thank you, sir. And thank you all.